Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. How does the United States get Africa so wrong? And why are other powers like China and Russia and Turkey making more headway on the continent? Let's get to the bottom line. No one can blame Africans for assuming that the rest of the world has very little interest in their continent, except maybe for extracting natural resources like gold and oil or buying weapons and counterterrorism. Former U.S. President George W. Bush famously referred to it as a nation instead of a continent with 54 very diverse countries, each with its own unique interests in history. President Trump had awful things to say about Africa, and we're not going to repeat them here. The West simply hasn't updated its views on Africa for centuries. Either it's a place for global competition between the great powers, or it's in need of Christian evangelism, or it needs help with food and medicine. There's an enormous gap between the realities of Africa's dynamism and its diversity, its entrepreneurship, that make the nations of Africa, many of them, some of the most fascinating places in the world. So is the United States missing out on the reality of Africa today? Who's getting it right, and who's filling that vacuum? Today, we're talking with Zainab Usman, senior fellow and director of the Africa program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and previously at the World Bank, and Yinka Adagoke, a veteran journalist who's been covering innovation in Africa for a long time for Reuters, Quartz, and more recently, Semaphore, where he is the Africa editor, and I'm also editor at large, so he's a colleague. Zainab, let me start with you and just ask, how outdated is America's conception and engagement with Africa as a continent? The perceptions of Africa in the U.S. are very much outdated, and I would say that they are stuck in the 20th century for the most part. You find this across various levels of American society. So overall, Africa is seen as a humanitarian case wracked by conflict, by corruption, by terrorism, and in need of aid, as you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, all of these things are true. The problem is that they are incomplete they present an incomplete picture of where African countries are today. So within the American government, uh, things are starting to shift, but overall Africa is seen as a humanitarian backwater that is not central to U.S. strategic priorities. As you have in the case of Europe, you can see with the war in Ukraine, all of the billions of dollars that Ukraine and even, even, even other European countries have received, or in the case of parts of Asia, so Africa is not seen as, a, as core to U.S. strategic priorities. President Biden has not visited Africa uh, since he assumed office over a year ago, although he has visited uh, Europe. He has visited the Middle East. We saw the trip to Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, President Trump never visited Africa and mm. called Africa, used very colorful language to describe Africa. I mean, uh, I mean just want to say he used abhorrent language to describe ab Africa. Abhorrent language, absolutely. Yeah. At the level of uh, economic engagement, investments, and trade, we're also seeing that the numbers are really declining precipitously. Take trade, for example. Uh, you, uh, trade between the United States and African countries has actually declined from around $160 billion in 2008 to just around $64 billion today. And most of that is actually, when you disaggregate it, it's mostly... Uh, it involves uh, uh, oil and gas, extractive industries. It's not really trade in substantial things that can really transform African economies, unlike what you have in China, with the case of China. So trade between China and African countries reached a historic high of over $250 billion in 2021 last year. And then finally, all of this is tied up with, um, I would say, media narratives on Africa in the United States, which are still very much dated. Again, this perception that Africa is wracked by conflict, you know, it's a humanitarian crisis, all of those things. And unfortunately, I think they affect how ordinary Americans see Africa. You have a lot of reluctance from many people to engage with a part of the world that they feel is very, very problematic. But when we come to the issues, Yinka, of, of talking about, you know, Africa and, and what is happening there, I think part of the question is why are China, Turkey, even Russia getting that story and Americans are not. To your point about dynamism, it is also the place w with the, the world's youngest population. And, and, you know, it's often, even that sometimes is portrayed as a, as a, as a problem, as a, 
as a disadvantage, but actually the, the world will be relying on African workers uh, in the next 30 to 40 years, because um, it is the only continent actually producing people who will be the future of humanity, really, in terms of, of, of young workers. But also, if you look at it today, there's a, a fast-growing fast growing tech hubs across the continent, which are the, you know, some of the one place in the, in the world where the, the, the slowdown in tech investment hasn't, hasn't happened. Um, more companies are coming out of there. And often, even that story is told as African companies doing stuff for African people. But actually, increasingly, because of this same issue about young tech workers and, and where talent is, what the internet has done is it's opened up the world. So even the young tech workers are beginning to be the tech workers for massive companies like Google and Microsoft are on the continent. Zainab, if I were to kind of look at the kind of a, at the ingredients, if I wanted to kind of recreate what happened with, say, the Asian tigers, the tiger economies that, that grew so quickly and fast, part of it is having a big population. Part of it is having human capital that's there. You've got 1.2 billion uh, people. As I've learned from your article, I should tell people you can read Zainab's work in Foreign Affairs recently, How America Can Foster an African Boom. But you document in here that here you've got 1.2 billion people, greater, greater investment in human capital, a very young audience. T tomorrow's future global middle class, a big chunk of it, will be in Africa. And so I guess my question is, what needs to happen by way of the social contract in some side of some of these African nations to fuel some of what um, Yinka was just referring to, the economic dynamism? And, you know, is there a space for someone like America to be part of it? And I, I guess my, it, my other part of it, does it matter if we're part of it? Yes, a very, very crucial questions. Um, I think I'm going to build on what Yinka said about Africa's population and also, I guess, Africa's fundamentals. Those fundamentals, whether it's the demographics, whether it's uh, the economic structure of African countries, they present both opportunities and challenges. Unfortunately, the narratives today overemphasize on the challenges, right? So, yes, there's conflict. Yes, there's violence in certain parts of the continent. But actually, when you look at um, certain analyses that have been done by whether it's entities like Statista and others, the world's most violent cities, the top 10, only one is in Africa, Cape Town. All of the other cities are in Latin America, in Brazil, in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's just that the challenges in Africa are overemphasized. And the fundamentals today present opportunities. And what are those opportunities? So you, let's take demographics, for example. The continent has the world's fastest uh, growing population, and it's also the world's youngest. Median age in Africa today is around 19, compared to around 30 in the Middle East and in South Asia, um, in, in Asia, compared to around 38 in the U.S. Mm. and in China, and also very importantly compared to, I think, 44 or 45 in Europe. So Africa is a young uh, continent, and it's growing. It's going to be the continent with the world's future labor force. So already... You know, if you want to think constructively... Future labor force and future buyers, future Future consumers. buyers, future consumers. And we've seen already entities from China have made a lot of headway on this front because they've seen that potential. So uh, mobile phone companies like Transion became global market leaders today because of their investments in Africa. Whereas companies from other parts of the world in the early 2000s felt that Africans were too poor to afford mobile phones. And there are examples like that across the board. So the challenges today, when you look at it and you invest there and you create opportunities for all these young people, become opportunities for companies in the future, right? So I think it's a matter of a mindset shift. And then to the last part of your question, is there a role for uh, the U.S.? There is, of course, a huge role for the U.S. to play. You look at the comparative advantage of the U.S., the way I would frame it anyways, uh, in terms of private capital, this is the world's largest market economy. African countries need investments, right? It's actually a dearth of investments, especially around infrastructure mm. in the early 2000s that made a lot of African countries turn to China because they were not getting the investments from Western bilateral lenders or even from the World Bank and other multilateral lenders. They turned to China. Mm. Th those investment needs are still there. The continent needs about $150 billion every year for infrastructure investments. The continent, again, needs around $50 billion for climate adaptation, right, to be able to invest in, um, you know, climate-resistant uh, agriculture, 
crops, buildings, bridges, etc. Those are all things that the U.S. can help with. Uh, digital technologies, you know, we have Silicon Valley. If companies want to expand to new markets today and in the future, Africa is the place. So there are so many examples like these that I can bring that there's so much that can be done. Uh, the U.S. has a role to play, but the mindset has to shift to see Africa not just as a continent of problems, but a continent where when you think innovatively of addressing those problems, you come up with solutions that work for Africans, but that also work for the investor and the partner country. Right. Well, let me ask you, Yinka, you know, there are companies like Qualcomm and Microsoft and MasterCard that I happen to personally know are investing and building teams to approach the African market much more mm -hmm. um, earnestly and to invest mm -hmm. to kind of look at that going on. I'm just interested, you know, we're still, we haven't talked many about the sort of member states, but, you know, you're going to be at Semaphore. Uh, folks can follow your Africa newsletter, by the way, but you know, you're going to be at Semaphore writing about nations and summers and some of the economic dynamism. I'd just be interested, just top of mind, you know, what are some of the stories that you think are worthy, worthy of writing in, in, in specific countries? Um, I think very much about, uh, I have a, a big bias towards uh, tech and innovation. And it's all the, it, 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 again, it ties to something that Zainab touched on there about the way, because of a lack of traditional, uh, a legacy of a lack of infrastructure and various challenges, you see some of the most creative solutions to problems on the continent. And uh, what we're finding more and more is that the, the story that I, the stories that I'm looking at are stories about African companies solving problems at home, but then taking taking those solutions to other parts of the world, right? Go, go, going into Latin America, right? there are a couple of companies um, that I know. But obviously, we want to break exclusives on this, um, as you know, Steve. But um, there, there are a couple of companies that are are, are going to be launching in uh, in Brazil that have. Um, started out in uh, Kenya and Nigeria. Um, and we're going to see that kind of thing happening more often. We're also going to see um, uh, more... Uh, w w the story has obviously been a lot about China coming into to, um, Africa to invest, but increasingly we're going to have more stories about uh, Japan and Turkey um, and other uh, sorts of... Um, other sort of fairly wealthy countries that are not uh, traditional Western countries or, or China, who, are, who also see the opportunity of both investing in um, being a supplier partner, but also seeing a market opportunity as well, understanding that you know, this, this, this 1.2 billion people or even more um, can, can be a, an incredibly uh, promising market for them. Mm. So I, th I, think that's, I think that we're going to see a lot of that going forward. Zina, let me ask you a question, and I don't know if I'm going to get this right, but I'm going to try. I think there's also a sense that African leadership, who does want input from various places, wants investment. But I think part of the social contract or the expectation is that Africa matters and Africa leaders should also care about other things in the world, that there are public goods problems around the world, whether it's climate, whether it's transnational crime, whether it's, you know, any number of other issues. Right now, um, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And when President Zelensky was going to speak to 54 invited uh, leaders from Africa, four leaders showed up. I guess my question to you is, should we have greater expectations as we look at what the United States is not getting right in, in this, which I want to get at, but are they in terms of African leadership not stepping up to some of the big global challenges to show that they're connected to things beyond Africa? Is that a part of going up the ladder, if you will, of both development and international respect? Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. Um, you know, African countries need to uh, step up a bit more. Uh, I would say they would need to step up more internally and address certain governance challenges mm. that are hobbling uh, the large economies and the large countries of the continent, you think about Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So when you mention Ethiopia. governance, are you really saying corruption? Uh, so it's not just corruption. Corruption is one aspect of it, but uh, we cannot reduce the entirety of the complexities of mm. governance to just corruption. 
It's really around delivering public services, public goods, increasing standards of living, hmm. uh, increasing prosperity, stability, uh, addressing inequalities, uh, giving people a sense of inclusion and fairness, all of those things, they need to be addressed, especially in the large economies. Hmm. And in a way, that is, in, in, in a sense, that's why they're not really punching above their weight in many respects. So, you know, absolutely, and that responsibility lies with African countries individually, but also collectively. And we're starting to see progress on that front. They came together, the 55 countries of the African Union, to put forward the vision of an integrated continent through the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, hmm. which is the world's, one of the world's largest free trade areas. There's an Agenda 2063 to industrialize and transform the continent. Having said that, though... And that, and that came into force last year, right? The Africa Continental Free Trade Area, I think about a, a year ago or so. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but having said that, the, you know, and identified the responsibilities of African countries, I think at a global level, it's also the fact that there's a, there's a lack of representation, equitable representation in multilateral fora, mm -hmm. uh, where in the case of the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council, the permanent membership, you have five countries there. There's no African country. We have a country that is a member of the UN Security Council. I'm not going to mention it. It has a population of 60 million. But the African continent, whether it's Nigeria with 200 million people or uh, Ethiopia with uh, close to uh, over 100 million people or the DRC, there's no representation of the African continent at all. There's no representation even of India, which has 1.5 billion people. So our global governance institutions are also not very equitable in terms of mm. representation. If we want African countries to step up, they need to be at the table. When it comes to the G20, there are 19 member states of the G20, uh, as well as the European Union. The European Union has 27 countries and a population of 450 million people. Why is the African Union with 55 countries and a population of close to 1.5 billion people, not a member of the G20. So if we want African countries to step up, and I think they should step up on global issues, they should be given a seat at the table of decision making. And it goes like that across the board, you know, the membership and the shareholding and the voting power at the World Bank and the IMF, the allocation of special drawing rights across the board, you find that African countries sometimes are completely excluded so if we want them to step up to the plate on decision making, they need to be given a seat at the table. That's fascinating. Um, Yinka, you know, you and I have talked about the African Leaders Summit, which is going to take place in Washington, D.C. Uh, in December of 2022. Right. And, and in yes. that summit, I'm interested in the Yinka Adagoke analysis of you know, to, to get to some of the points that um, uh, Zainab just mentioned, which is to measure whether any successful structural shift occurred, you know, is it greater representation or at least American support for greater African representation in some of these international institutions? What would you be saying this was either a failure or this was a success, um, you know, after that summit occurs? Well, I think uh, what we'd be looking out for is you know, how, how, how seriously did the U.S., uh, the Biden administration take uh, this event? Was it just something that they felt they had to do? Was it just a, a, a sort of a convenient uh, event before um, Biden's term is out? Because to that point about Biden never actually going to the African continent and then only sending out um, uh, Secretary Blinken on a kind of uh, one-off mission. But what what people will want to hear, what those leaders will want to hear, is some serious commitment from um, the U.S. government towards uh, African countries. To that point about what sort of uh, investments are you actually going to make? Are you are you just are you just there, you know, doing the usual sort of um, ticking boxes and making sure you're seeing for photo opportunities, or actually are we actually going to get anything of substance? In terms of key decisions, like key investments, you know, every every um, every I don't know was every two or every three years, the the Chinese have the the, the FOCAC um, uh, conference with with China, with African leaders, and it goes back and forth between Beijing and an African city, and there are there's the actual substantive issues, the substantive 
um, uh, sort of elements that come out of those of those uh, meetings every two or three years. This this needs to happen with with the Biden administration, or always sorry, with the U.S. government, with any U.S. government. It needs to be a regular, a normalized um, sort of events rather than a kind of it happens this time and then you don't hear about it for another four or five years and uh, and then sometimes it, it, another administration comes in and there's a complete change of sort of uh, um, you know um, attitude towards Africa. Um, there needs to be some consistency and they need to be able to come out with actual sort of you know it, it, frankly just call it what it is put some put a dollar sign a number right. on, 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 right. on what. Or well, what they, they actually want to do with, with the African continent. But I'm interested in, as you look at China and Turkey and even Russia, which you have written about, who are now significant players, China the biggest investor uh, in Africa today, what are they getting right that America is not doing and needs to pay attention to? Um, to begin with, I would say that I, I think the U.S. is starting to recalibrate its thinking on Africa, which is a good thing. And uh, in fact, um, in August uh, this year, a new strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa was published by the Biden administration mm. that envisions a new partnership between the United States and African countries. And that is a very good start. Of course, then there is the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, which is coming up in December this year, which is uh, a follow-on to uh, the first summit that was done in 2014 or so. Uh, during the time of uh, Barack Obama. All of those are good, but they're not enough. More needs to be done. Mm. So what is that more that needs to be done? And if we take uh, the example or take a cue from what China, Turkey, and others are doing so well, I think the first thing is really that mindset shift, that this is a continent of opportunity. If you talk to whether it's Chinese entrepreneurs or even some government officials, they would tell you, to us, we see many parts of Africa as what China used to be 20 mm. years ago. Like we see the potential right. here. We see that there's a future mi middle class and they need services, they need schools, they need hospitals, they need mobile phones, mm. all of those things and those create opportunities. So it's a mindset shift that uh, there are opportunities here as well as there are challenges. I would say that is really, really the main thing. Perhaps the second thing is also that, um, uh, that Africa is crucial to global issues, not just in its, you know, Africa as a silo, but Africa, whatever happens there, is going to affect and shape the rest of the world. You know, we're already starting to see this. You mentioned the Ukraine war, right. you know, the votes in the UN. Uh, we cannot just ignore Africa. What, ma what happens in Africa matters for the rest of the world, and the U.S. can actually support some Africa initiatives some Africa causes, whether it's you know, joining the UN Security Council, the permanent uh, membership, or the G20, there are things that the US can use its influence, its convening power, uh, influence particularly with the European allies to push those causes for Africa. Political economist Zainab Usman and journalist Yinka Aragoke, thank you so much for being with us today. So what's the bottom line? From Algeria to Zimbabwe, folks in Africa are busy building biotech hubs hosting innovation challenges, and scaling their entrepreneurship across the continent. America is still there, but faintly. Most of the fresh ink on the deals that will bring major economic development are either Chinese or Russian or Turkish. America still looks at the continent through archaic lenses, a poor, war-torn place dependent on outsiders and in need of saving by the West, and more recently as a base for special forces and counterterrorism. Sure, there are real hotspots, but Washington is generally losing out. Countries that have updated their worldview on Africa are making partnerships and planting the seeds for the future. And if Washington doesn't do the same, it's going to miss the proverbial African boat. And that's the bottom line.